Gary is an internationally celebrated nature writer, seed saver, conservation biologist at the University of Arizona, and sustainable agriculture activist who has been called the father of the local food movement by Mother Earth News. For his writing and collab collaborative conservation work, Gary has been honored with the MacArthur Genius Award, a Southwest Book Award, the John Burroughs Medal for Nature Writing, the Vavilov Medal, and Lifetime Achievement Awards for the Quivira Coalition and Society for Ethnobiology. He works most of the year as a research scientist at the Southwest Center of the University of Arizona and the rest as co-founder and facilitator of several food and farming alliances, including Renewing America's Food Traditions and Flavors Without Borders. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Napham. Thank you, Michael, and thank you to uh, Elizabeth and Chuck and Loretta for hosting me and to all of you for coming out. I hope we'll have a good discussion with this. I'm going to show some pretty pictures and uh, uh, give you some uh, hints of what, uh, not just what I'm working on, but our community is working on in southern Arizona that may be parallel to some things uh, that you're working on here. And I, I really go on the road to exchange ideas with uh, communities because many of us are in the same places with slightly different um, challenges. Our challenge is most often that we don't have any water or any soil to, to grow things with, and those are minor handicaps. But other than that, we're, um, we're working on local and regional food systems that are healthy and resilient and equitable and just, just like many people here are. So I'm uh, hopefully going to um, encourage you to ask questions anytime through this as well as at the end. So if you have something that you want to ask about, say, go into more detail about that, I'd be happy to do it. Um, just have a new book out with two dear friends of mine that's about farming and climate change. And I, although I could talk ad nauseum just about that topic, and it's sprinkled in a few places here. Um, I really am um, much more interested in the larger question of what do we do about climate change? What, how do we design food systems that are um, capable of adapting to it and fulfilling all the other needs that we have in our community, of community building, of bringing healthy, nutritious, affordable food to our kids and to our elders? And so rather than uh, just touting, you know, the new book that I have out, I've really designed this to hopefully inspire uh, everyone to um, work at being co-designers of our food systems, that we need to all take that one on, that there's sort of an artistic creativity that goes into designing food systems, just like if we were designing the landscape in our backyard or or our living room, or uh, uh, a painting. And that if we, if we see that there's uh, something there that can both um, nourish us aesthetically as well as physically, it may encourage more people to think that they could be part of that process of redesigning our food systems. And of course, one reason we need to redesign them is because of this climate change. It isn't something that's impending. It's already here. Uh, so we'll, we'll get into the reasons why, but I think many of you know them already. And I'm going to use this word almunia several times, which is an Arabic term that came into Spanish through the Moors. And it's really talking about, um, I think, a powerful idea. Now in this country, when we talk about agricultural experiment stations. We think of the federal government in collaboration with our state government doing this. Well, I think the horticultural program here, what you can do through being members of groups like the Home Orchard Society or Tilth is as much about this idea of taking back the notion that each of us need to be uh, plant introduction uh, promoters and plant evaluation promoters of native and adapted plants to our own food system. And so it means that we, we don't leave it to a few experts in the governments or land-grant colleges 
to provide us with the plant and food diversity that we want, but all of us are engaged in that, in taking observations on what works in our locality and how it tastes. And I think that's fun stuff. I think everyone uh, can find a role in that, so we'll talk about that too. Okay, let me see if I know how projectors work. Um, first of all, um, you know, it, it's always funny for a desert rat to come up here uh, to the Pacific Northwest to Salmon Nation because in ways you all are so far ahead of other regions of the world in identifying the regional foods that are special and bringing them into your restaurants and CSAs and farmers markets. Uh, uh, I would say that the, the local food movement didn't begin in California or, or with Alice Waters or back in the Boston area with Chef's Collaborative, but it began right here in this area, and that's why groups like Chef's Collaborative love coming to Portland area. They're, they had their first meeting here, and I think the next one uh, that the national group has is going to be here in the fall because this area has been pivotal to the whole growth of the, um, the local food movement. And again, I would like to correct that. I'm not really the father of the local food movement. I'm the weird uncle. Okay? My wife always says, there's something you haven't been telling me. Who's the mother? You know. Anyway, one thing is uh, uh, that this region has the most interesting mix of wild foods, not only mushrooms and berries, but shellfish and fish and, and other marine invertebrates as well, in the food system and on the plate, as well as great cultivated foods. And that balance is different here in the Pacific Northwest than any other region in the country. I mean, even in comparable climates on the East Coast, you don't have the richness that you have here. So there's something really, really wonderful about uh, the food biodiversity of the uh, Salmon Nation Pacific Northwest. And that comes not only from the incredible depth and richness of the native cultures here, but also the important contributions that, that immigrant cultures from the early Russians that came to this region to Actually, the weirdest one, I think, is the Spanish bringing up potatoes from South America straight up the West Coast to this area. And the, the potatoes uh, that the Clinket and, and uh, um, uh, other people have from Monterey Bay all the way up to Alaska, um, that, that they're still growing on uh, uh, First Nations lands are the only potatoes in North America that didn't go to Europe first and then come back to uh, the Americas. So they're really, really uh, wonderful. And the Ozat Macaw uh, potato that is now being um, featured in some Portland restaurants is one of the great examples of that. Um, but this great food diversity is not necessarily all in safe hands. Um, about uh, five years ago, when we launched the Renewing America's Food Traditions uh, Alliance nationally, the first region where we got to work was here with uh, the great staff at EcoTrust and many of the other nonprofits <coughs> in the region and, and the terrific farmers and orchard keepers, some of whom just have an encyclopedic knowledge of all the fruits and vegetables that have been grown in the Northwest over the last uh, 50 to 100 years. And we did this little book that Oregon State Press, um, uh, I think, uh, distributes for EcoTrust. You can get it through their office or online. But um, of the 180 foods that are unique to the region um, that can't be found in other regions, either as stocks or varieties or species, um, half of those are now endangered in the sense that there's only one to three seed catalogs, nurseries, or for fish, hatcheries, and for, for wild species, plant nurseries, that um, offer them.